14 hours of tirelessly operating dangerous machines a day, 73 hours of monotonous and exhausting work per week, a deplorable living quarter over-occupied with six people a bedroom, a history of constant protests and strikes against this company. All of this corruption and misrepresentation leads to one company formed from the glory of the Industrial Revolution, a staple of disgraceful working conditions in the early 19th century. Hi, I'm Alex Dow and I work in an entry-level job. Hello, my name is AJ and I'm also in the entry-level workforce. The workforce has changed a lot since the 1830s and 40s. Since this time, paying working conditions have got a lot better. So in the pursuit of learning, we will go out on a journey to learn about the workforce's past. As we arrived at the Lowell Cotton Mills, we were fascinated by the history around us. The Lowell Cotton Mills began their operations in the early 1820s. Their business was unique because they started to employ women to work at the mills because their lives were very challenging at the farms where they supposedly came from. This allowed the mills to employ women and pay them with very low wages and deplorable living quarters. These young women were sent to work over 12 hours a day, six days a week, with only Sundays for rest. Their repetitive and dangerous jobs included operating unsafe and complicated machines and the constant lint emanating throughout the air that commonly caused lung cancer among workers. Because of this, the workers went on strike in 1836 after their pay was cut. Eventually, this turned into advocating for a 10-hour workday and safer working conditions. In 1845, the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association, or LFLRA, was formed. The LFLRA fought hard for the well-being of workers with their long working hours and the dangerous machines they were forced to operate. When we finally entered the cotton mills, we could almost grasp what it was really like to work on this cotton mill. After taking in the deafening sounds of machinery, we met with the director of the Sangus Industrial Center to learn more about this history. In the boarding houses, one of the pluses was that young women got to meet other young women from all around New England, and that was probably pretty stimulating. They were sharing pieces of reading material, the poems and things like that. They belonged to self-improvement groups. Uh, in the evening they could sit in the dining room or in the parlor. And it's always good, I think, to think about the pros and the cons of a situation in history so you're not coloring the picture too much. In that same boarding house, you were rising very early. Depending on the season, you might be getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning quickly getting dressed and hurrying into the mill. There was no electricity in the period I'm talking about, which is roughly the 1820s to the 1840s or so. So you weren't gonna be in the mill in the winter late at night because the only light was from whale oil lamps, of course, an open flame, even if it's behind a globe. When the days were long, it could be very tedious and difficult to be in a mill. Yes, you're breathing in lint, but you can also get your hair caught in a leather belt you can get a, a part of your clothing. They wore long dresses with long sleeves caught in some part of the equipment and you maybe try to cut yourself free very quickly. Uh, but there were some sometimes horrific accidents. It's not like they happened every day on every floor. But boy, when one happened, the word got out because it could be pretty gruesome. The other danger of working in a lot of the spaces in a factory or in one of Lowell's mills was that there was an awful lot of noise and that noise could gradually deafen somebody who spent enough years in the mill. If they were working six days a week that was a lot of exposure to lint, to uh, standing on their feet all day, to the hazards of getting caught up in a machine and just to the, the harm to their spirit of being uh, in such a monotonous situation uh, for so many hours of, uh, of a seven-day week. You know, some instances they 
vaguely alluded to where uh, sexual harassment was something that they had to face. So I, I, would, I would consider that a kind of a danger that wasn't as much talked about in the mills. I don't know of a direct connection. I haven't read of any current or recent activists saying they were inspired by the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association, but it would amaze me if there if you couldn't trace a line from that early female activism, which got a lot of attention because it was so unusual, it was really uh, frowned upon for women to be speaking out in public, especially to a mixed audience. Uh, for them to be mistreated the way they were in the factory by having these monotonous jobs, by not being really paid all that well, and sometimes their boarding house rates, would their, their fees would go up, um, which was essentially a pay cut, and sometimes their pay was cut. And they worked long hours and they got fed up with it. So they together decided to protest in a group, uh, and it was effective. It took decades for certain things to pass, like the 10-hour law, but ultimately they prevailed. And they had to have been an inspiration to the early suffragists. Some of these women were suffragists, and they also protested against slavery when they could in their after-work hours, uh, or they sometimes uh, contributed some of their hard-earned pay to some of these causes. It's easy to imagine a, a, a line from their early activism leading up to 20 and 21st century activism. After visiting the Lowell Cotton Mills, we saw the striking differences between working conditions now versus then. We could really see how the protests of the 1830s changed workforces for the better, allowing us to have the appreciable working conditions we work in today. Unfortunately, there is still more to be changed. The federal minimum wage is too low for workers to pay their taxes, debts, loans, and even for their own health. A lack of training in the modern day workforce also leads to inexperienced workers. As the present commonly replicates the past, let us stand up against the working conditions of today in hopes for better working conditions tomorrow, just like the LFLRA of yesterday. We must combat these problems like the ruthless woman who fought for their rights, while still remembering their hardships along the way. <laughs>